Hello, I'm Jared Younger. I'm director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Laboratory. And today I want to talk about a new brain scan that we've developed that may show how people are getting brain inflammation and why they're getting brain inflammation. The scan that I'm going to talk about allows us to track leukocytes or white blood cells that can break through the blood brain barrier and enter the brain and be in a place where they're not supposed to be. And when they do that, they can set off kind of an inflammatory pathway that can be causing a lot of fatigue and pain and cognitive disorders. So I think that this is going to be important for uh, potentially long COVID, uh, Gulf War illness, fibromyalgia, uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome. And it's also going to be very important for neurodegenerative disorders like multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So I want to give you the general story behind this new scan, like why we developed it, what am I hoping to see. I'll tell you how it works. I'll show you some preliminary results. So I've got a few images to share with you and I'll update you on the timeline as of right now. So the basic idea is I've been trying for about 10 years to figure out why people have inflammation in their brain chronically. We can see through some scans that there's, there's inflammatory processes going on, but we don't know what's causing it. One hypothesis I've had for quite a while is that immune cells from the body have infiltrated the brain and they're operating in an environment where they're not trained to be. So as you, I'm sure most of you know, we have a blood brain barrier. You know, in our body, our blood vessels are made up primarily of endothelial cells. And that allows things to go through the blood vessels, but also uh, interact with the tissue as well. So things can leave the blood vessels in the body. When those vessels reach the brain, things change a bit. You still have endothelial cells forming the blood vessels, but you have extra layers which we call the blood brain barrier. And these are designed to keep things in the vessels and not leak out into the brain. And so they're basically designed to keep things that are too dangerous for the brain because the brain is a very, very tightly controlled system. Keep that out of the brain and allow them to interact more with the body than in the brain. One of the things that the blood brain barrier keeps inside the vessels are leukocytes or again, white blood, uh, white blood cells. Those leukocytes are the immune system cells that you've all heard about. It's the T cells, the B cells, the T helper cells, things like that. In our body, we use those cells to fight off uh, infections and to handle inflammation. But in the brain, we don't use those cells. We use microglia and astrocytes. So we have a peripheral immune system and we have a central immune system and they're not supposed to interact that much. They're kept separate, again, by the blood-brain barrier. There's some really, really dire life-threatening emergencies where cells in the brain may request help from the peripheral immune system, but that is very uncommon, usually when there's a severe bacterial infection in the brain and, and uh, there's horrendous inflammation. That, again, is life-threatening. Other than that, you should not see leukocytes in the brain. They're just not supposed to be up there, and they don't know, again, how to handle that environment. And so they can cause more harm than good if they're up there, especially chronically. Now, what I suspect is happening in things like myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, is that the leukocytes have somehow made their way through the blood-brain barrier, and now they're operating in the brain environment. Now, how that happens, uh, we don't know. That's almost impossible to observe in living, living humans. Um, maybe the leukocytes have found a way to force themselves into the brain. There are some kind of weak areas throughout the system where they might force their way in. Uh, so that's one way it could happen. Um, it could be that the blood-brain barrier itself has become degraded, and so there's gaps in the blood-brain barrier. That's, that's possible. Um, or perhaps a cell in the brain is inviting the leukocytes through. Um, we know that microglia do have the ability to request support from leukocytes. And so it could be a microglia cell acting um, in an abnormal fashion, having leukocytes come through when it's not supposed to. It's like, um, you know, you can imagine 
someone cutting a hole in a fence and then pulling the fence back and say, come on, come on, come on, come on, and letting uh, their comrades through. Except in this case, it's uh, microglia cutting the hole and leukocytes sneaking their way through. We don't know that's exactly what's happening. And really, it doesn't matter of those three scenarios. In all of those cases, you have leukocytes in the brain when they should not be there. And that's a bad situation. When you have inflammation in the brain, you're going to have almost for sure, you're going to have profound fatigue. You're going to have cognitive issues. You're going to have a reduction of motivation. You're going to have general malaise. You will likely have anxiety um, and or de uh, depressive symptoms and lots of other symptoms, uh, which are which a lot of these conditions I've mentioned earlier have in common. Now, you might have heard something like this before, and it's true that there's a precedent for this idea of immune cells getting into the brain. We see this also with multiple sclerosis, and multiple sclerosis is when T cells enter the brain and they start to attack neurons, the myelin sheath of neurons, and that's because those T cells mistake the myelin sheath proteins as an invader. And that, so that's an autoimmune disorder. Now, the big difference is that in multiple sclerosis, the leukocytes are autoreactive. And so they're actually directly attacking the uh, brain tissue, again, the, the myelin sheath of the neurons. In the case I'm talking about today, there's no evidence that the leukocytes are actually targeting anything in the brain. So it is not a neurodegenerative disorder. It's not something that's actually destroying brain tissue. Rather, it's causing general inflammation. But that's still a really bad thing. It's still very debilitating and will cause a lot of symptoms. But just to reiterate, I do not consider any of the conditions I mentioned earlier um, in terms of the big four that we look at to be similar to Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or multiple sclerosis. That's a different class of disorders. In any case, if we think leukocytes are entering the brain and that's what's causing things like fibromyalgia and ME-CFS and long COVID and Gulf War illness, um, how are we going to treat that? Uh, well, the first step before we can get to treatment is we have to demonstrate that that's actually what's wrong or else people won't want to develop treatments. They want to see that this is actually the pathology before the treatments are developed. And so I've spent really 10 years trying to come up with the best way to image leukocytes in the brain. And there are some different paths I went. I abandoned most of those. And so instead of talking about those, I'm gonna talk about the one that actually worked today. And that is leukocyte tracking using PET or positron emission tomography with zirconium 89 oxine labeled leukocytes. So this was developed by radiochemist Suzanne Lappy and radiologist uh, John McConathy, and they're both uh, faculty here at UAB, the same institution where I'm at. The process is conceptually simple. It's easy for me to explain. I can tell you from getting reports from Lappy's team and McConathy's team, it is very, very complex to actually get it to work. But again, conceptually, I can explain it uh, quite easily. The idea is you pull blood from the, the patient or the participant, you isolate the leukocytes, get rid of everything else, you incubate those uh, leukocytes with the ZR89 oxine. That ZR89 oxine is a PET tracer, so it emits um, a radio signal that you can pick up. You take those labeled uh, leukocytes and then you re-inject them into the participant and then you wait maybe one, two, or three days, probably three days, and then see, you can do a whole body scan and see where the cells went, which we, you can now pick up with the PET scan. If we find any of the labeled leukocytes in the brain, that means they infiltrated the brain. So again, it, I think it's a very straightforward way to see the pathology. It's very easy to interpret. Now, what we've done so far is we've run four healthy controls, and this was needed for FDA safety requirements. Now, all four healthy individuals went perfect. The leukocytes went 
exactly to the places where we expected them to go to. They behave normally. That's a that was a big question. We didn't know once they were incubated with this pet tracer, would they act abnormally? Would they or would they die? Um, it turns out that they seem to act perfectly normal after this process, which is great. I want to show you some images. Um, first of all, this is our first participant. This is about 24 hours after the administration of the ZR89 oxine labeled leukocytes. And these are where the cells are, the labeled cells. And in this case, in, in all four cases, the cells went exactly to the places where they're supposed to go. They should not be in the brain and we don't see any signal, really any signal in the head much at all. But where they're at is in the area of the heart and lungs and in the pelvis, uh, particularly the marrow. And that's where the leukocytes like to hang out. Now this image is kind of a, it's a CT scan, similar things, uh, some different people at different time points and really just shows you that really it doesn't matter the individual and it doesn't matter the time point, whether it's immediate or 24 or 48 hours, we see pretty much the same thing. The leukocytes are staying in the body, they're not entering the brain, and they're going to the places that they should go to when there's not an infection that's requesting uh, where they're being requested. So this looks perfectly normal. You can see the one on the far left. You can see more of the blood vessels, and that's because that's one taken right after administration. And so those labeled cells are still in the blood supply. They haven't um, arrived at their destination yet. So now let's go to the brain, and things look really good in the brain as well. So this is the same thing. It's the PET scan, but now we're looking just at the brain. And this is a top-down view, which we call an, an axial view. And what we can see here, you see those red bright spots. That's where the labeled cells are. And all of these labeled cells are in the blood supply. So these are the veins or the sinuses that are draining the blood from the brain. And I put arrows in the major sinuses, and that's where we see the large signals. What that means is that, yes, if you look in the head, you do see some labeled leukocytes, but they're not in the brain. They're not in the white matter or the gray matter. They're actually in the blood vessels. So they're going up into the head and they're coming back out. They're not getting through the blood brain barrier and into the brain tissue. So I think the last image I wanna show you right here is um, this is time at the bottom from zero hours to 50. And then uh, on the other axis is your strength of the signal. So basically where did the leukocytes go? at different time points. You can see first is the red line. Things started, the leukocytes started in the blood in the first measurement, which is exactly what it, where they should be. And then as they reach their destination, you see uh, fewer cells in the blood supply over time. Then where did they go? If you look at the second um, line, which is purplish, you see that's the marrow. And so, um, again, this is where you expect leukocytes to go when they're not being actively used. And at first, the signal is not as strong because the cells are in the blood supply. But then over time, you get more signal in the marrow, which is what you would expect. And then really the only other, and these are images in the head, uh, that brown line, the third one, is really the only other area with some strong signal, and that is the uh, temporalis muscle, which is a muscle on the sides of the head. And so basically, we're seeing leukocytes different in different aspects of the head, but not in the brain. So we know that this works. We get good images. And if these cells do get into the brain, we should be able to see them. So it's been perfect so far. It took years to get it to this point. As I said, it's extremely complicated but it does work. Now the next thing to do is to see if the hypothesis is correct. When we take a patient, because remember we've never run a patient. As of right now, it's only been healthy individuals. If we put a patient in, do we see leukocytes in the brain? It's really gonna come down to that. We're gonna run that person and I'm gonna be looking at those images as soon as I can uh, that Jonathan McConathy will prepare and analyze, and we'll just have our fingers crossed just seeing what uh, what happens. Uh, are the leukocytes in the brain or not? That's gonna be the big question. Now, if we do not see leukocytes in the brain, it's back to the drawing board, okay? Then if that's not it, then what's causing the inflammation? 
If we do see leukocytes in the brain, our first participant is going to be an MECFS participant. If we see the leukocytes in the brain, it's going to be um, it's going to be huge for the field, really without exaggeration, because that will point very strongly to particular treatments that have not been tried, but could be tried in MECFS. And this would give strong arguments for testing certain pharmaceuticals that could stop this process and keep those leukocytes from reaching the brain. And so, you know, I can't say, you know, I hope to find the truth. So, you know, it is what it is, but it would be nice if it turns out that it is something that we actually have some treatments for without having to spend 20 years developing it. So, you know, it'll be very interesting either way to see the results. And I'll certainly share that with everyone as soon as we are able to run our first one, two, three uh, patients. What do we actually find in those conditions? So anyway, to wrap this up, we're submitting the FDA safety data right now from all the healthies. I plan to run the first participant in within two months. That's my plan. A lot of times the plans don't work, but uh, that's, that is a reasonable uh, time frame to run a person. And again, we're going to run MECFS first, and I will let you know what we find. We will also test other conditions as well, because it's possible that it is not the case that leukocytes invade the brain in MECFS, but maybe it is in some of the other conditions. And so we'll definitely try those. So keep, um, keep track of what I'm releasing here. Again, I'm releasing videos uh, once a week to update you on this study and all the other imaging and clinical trial studies we're running. And I do want to give a thanks to ME <clears throat> Research UK, and they're the organization that funded us to do this work years ago uh, when we hadn't even figured out the first steps. And so I really thank their support for funding something that is so highly uh, experimental. But I thank you all for listening, and I will uh, come to you with another video very soon. So thanks.